So before we get into the uh, interview that we had with uh, Scott Appleby and Teron Jones, uh, I wanted to introduce Morgan Dancy. Hi. <laughs> and the forward program here at Housatonic Community College, and then explain the relationship between the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security here in Bridgeport and the school. Before we Ooh, listen to what, yeah, <laughs> before we listen to what Scott and Scott and Teron have to say about that relationship in in particular from their perspective. So. Um, Morgan, you are the, well, I'm, I'm, I'm the, I'm Ed Fines. I'm the content specialist for the Northeast Resiliency Consortium as a whole. I also do happen to teach here in the humanities department. Uh, I, I am a, in a, a part-time lecturer and adjunct professor here at Housatonic, as are you, Morgan. <laughs> I am. So I, my main role here is I'm the assistant coordinator for the forward program at Housatonic. And then, yes, I am also an adjunct. I teach literature. Um, but the forward program is just is the TACT grant here at Housatonic, and we are part of the consortium. So we are one of the seven schools in the consortium. And as part of our resiliency initiative, we teamed up with – Scott and Tehran from Emergency Management and Homeland Security here in Bridgeport teamed up them, with them very early on when the grant was first proposed and it was being written. Myself personally, I saw one of their um, one of their trainings that they did with our students, which was actually really great. They yeah. did one. Uh, it was about an hour and a half long, two hours. Yeah, mm -hmm. both of them were two hours. Um, mm -hmm. These were back in, in December of 2015, and Tehran and Scott came for our healthcare students. They did a presentation on for healthcare, and then IT students. That was separate. Mm -hmm. So those were great. Yeah. So and and hopefully they'll be back for you know back for more, as they say. All right, so uh, take a listen to what we got. We got about now half hour and a, uh, about a half hour of, of really good tape with Scott and Tehran, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to more of these roundtables in the near future. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. To start, I'd love to do a roll call. Sure. Um, a job title and a little bit about what that job title is. Left to right, if you would. Tehran Jones, Assistant Director of Emergency Management and Homeland Security for the City of Bridgeport, and. Part of that role is to just, basically our role is to corral all of the different agencies around the table in response to any type of man-made or natural disaster from a larger standpoint overall, not to get into any. Great. Uh, Scott Appleby, Director of Emergency Management, Homeland Security for the City of Bridgeport. Uh, basically, the, the role of emergency management and uh, Homeland Security is to ensure that we are planning, protecting, and um, uh, ensuring that the community is uh, ready strategically for all hazards that may impact um, not only our local jurisdiction, but our regional, state, and federal areas as well. Um, I'd definitely like to start off by what resiliency means in your field. You guys just talked about sort of the scope of your job titles, but what would you say the concept of resiliency has to do with that work explicitly? Yep. So, uh, you know, resiliency from, from an emergency management perspective is ensuring that people are prepared, um, the community is prepared um, for all types of hazards, that we're preventing um, hazards um, and or uh, incidents that relate to, say, man-made issues such as terrorism, uh, that people are um, preparing, planning, they're mitigating, they're able to respond and recover um, from any of those hazards that may impact us. Um, the, the key point of resiliency is to ensure that we're all sharing information, we're all working together, but most importantly, we're, we're all working to protect, um, you know, the lives and, and specifically the critical infrastructures of our communities. Yeah. Just to piggyback on what Scott said is that the self, um, the self efficacy part where the people that we train and that we do seminars for that they actually believe themselves that they can actually do these tasks and they can actually be prepared and just half the battle is believing that these businesses can um, plan recover and prepare for these type of e events resiliency is so much about it sounds like as for you guys has a lot to do with communication and everybody working sort of as you self self-efficacy like efficient mm -hmm. systems how does a private how do you build a public and something that is public and private where those two things you think are a little bit oil and water, maybe, you know, to a certain degree? How do you how does that happen? Is it simply personalities? Is it 
just, I mean, what, what, is it, what does it take to build that kind of relationship and that kind of infrastructure? Well, I think that the cliche is it's not the time to share your business cards at a scene of an incident. So mm-hmm. you need to, you know, you need to be working together and understanding the partnerships that are available to you within your community. There's a lot of resources from a private sector that can assist the, not only the first responders in response and um, preparedness side of the house, but also the recovery side of the house. Uh, the, the main focus that everyone has to remember whether you're an individual, you're, you're a business, you're a family, is that everybody plays a role in preparedness and resiliency and protection and, and most importantly, how you recover from all types of hazards that impact our community. Um, way we build it um, is that we allow everyone to have a seat at the table. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, over 90% of all critical infrastructures within the United States is privately owned. Um, really? The, yes. That sounds, that's an, I'm surprised by that number. Well, you think about it, right? You think about utility companies. You think about major businesses. You think about uh, water supplies. You think about um, uh, oil and, and food resources and just the whole, um, you know, uh, the perspective of a lot of these are not owned by government agencies. Um, they're regulated and or... That was going to be my next question. Yeah, is like, yeah. Is, yeah, so yeah. So they're, regu- they're regulated and or licensed by uh, government agencies, but they're certainly not um, owned by the agencies. So the partnerships have to be established uh, right from the get-go, and we have to ensure that there's a trust factor between the two agencies that we're not uh, providing any uh, secretive uh, product information to competitors and, and the like. And the overall goal, uh, really, in, in a nutshell, is the protection of life and property. And that's all we're concerned with right now, of, of getting people to safe areas, uh, protecting any uh, potential loss of lives due to an incident, uh, any type of hazard. But most importantly, that we could get that uh, agency, that critical infrastructure, back into the normal operations as soon as we can. Mm-hmm. Scott pretty much hit the nail on the uh, head um, as, as far as building relationships prior to any incident actually taking place. That's like the key, the kind of the emergency management key competencies. Is, you know, those are things that you have to do because when things happen, they happen fast and you have to know those contact information. It's not the time to go online and say, oh, what's this person from UI's phone number? You just mm-hmm. Information that you want to have in your cell phone readily available and you're not looking at your number like, who is this calling me? It's going to say Scott Appleby or Teron Jones. It's going to, they, they'll be able to identify with that person. So those, those things go a long way. Yeah, is, is how, I mean, maybe, you know, between you, me, and the lamppost, how hard is that? How, how, or how maybe how easy, what, what has it been like doing collaboration? Collaboration being a, sort of a competency that sort of NRC is certain, it's one of the five that we talk about in our classrooms to our students, certainly. How has collaboration been in making that happen, what you just described? I think for speaking on behalf of the city of Bridgeport, I mean, we, we've done very well in, in establishing the partnerships um, from those agencies that are critical to our community. Um, on a nationwide basis, you know, we, we look at the whole community approach uh, through the federal government, through the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Mm-hmm. Um, from your health care providers, you know, they have to follow certain standards and requirements to ensure that they have doctors and nurses available um, at uh, hospitals and our medical facilities at any given time to assist with um, life safety measures um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a challenge when people understand that these risks are, uh, these risks can happen to anybody. Um, once they understand that these risks can occur in every jurisdiction, and it's not, and it won't happen here, it happens elsewhere, um, that you start to break down that, um, that, that wall and the partnerships start to grow. Um, the, the trust factor, the, the ability to make people understand that we're all in this together approach, um, such as what Housatonic is, is trying to establish here, is to show in that whether or even if you're a student, you also could help spread the word of making sure that you're prepared in your field um, in, the, in the point of what you can do individually and then what you could do to help out and, and provide that message out to a community. So with that, how would you say a resilient IT or healthcare professional, this is one of our students who's just graduated and now they're entering the field, 
how do they help their community become resilient? Like, what does that look like exactly? Well, there, there's a lot of avenues, right? There's, there's number one is, um, you know, ensuring that you have your own individual plan of what you will do to respond to any type of hazard. Um, the second approach is making sure you have the proper equipment, uh, whether it be at your home, um, in your, you know, in your line of work, um, that will allow you to continually do what you're supposed to do. And then most importantly is getting involved. It's, it's uh, making sure information is being shared properly with your community leaders as well as the emergency management and Homeland Security staff, but ensuring that um, you are involved, whether it be a volunteer um, through community emergency response teams, um, by working to ensure that uh, if you are a healthcare worker, you're protected, that you have a plan um, in the event that you have to stay extra hours, um, that your family is protected, that you know your your pets are protected, um, and then most importantly, getting involved with your organizations to know what the emergency plan is, what the business recovery plans are, and how the continuity of operations work amongst those agencies. Um, you know, again, you know, an employee. Uh, we tend to leave our common sense of preparedness at home when we come into an office or we come into a work environment thinking somebody else is responsible for that. As I said earlier, we all are responsible ensuring that we're protected, we're prepared, and most importantly, we see something, we say something, and if it becomes a criminal and or an opportunity for someone to do some, do some harm um, to our, our critical infrastructures. And, and then most importantly, it's just making sure that you have the right, um, the right measures and the right plans in place to share information um, to the relevant officials. Well, uh, in terms of uh, healthcare in particular, you guys mentioned something at the seminar that you ran here uh, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. months ago. Yeah. Uh, so the idea of sort of taking care of your family and your surroundings first mm -hmm. as sort of the as sort of like good practice in preparation for a crisis. Th that seems a maybe I don't know if it's sort of counterintuitive, but it's certainly like so much is directed at. You know, you know, what am I going to do? Um, you know, uh, uh, do I have the materials at my place of work? Mm -hmm. But the idea that you've you've shored up yourself at home as sort of good good work practice it's it's a very interesting yeah. idea. To speak to and that. the the uh, reasoning for that is that some of the key factors and that we teach on a daily basis, on an annual basis, is that you have to take care of yourself and your families first because that's the that's. Uh, um, Every day when you wake up, you worry about your, your family and your job. And if you, you can't do your job if you're worried about what your family is, is, is doing at home. If you know that your family doesn't have food and there's a 40 inches of snow, you're going to be at work all day. Mm -hmm. Your concern, your mentality rather, it's not going to be about what's going on at work. You're going to be more concerned with your family and friends at, that are at um, And you might at, miss at, something at home. on mm -hmm. the job, right? Yep, yeah, it, exactly. So it kind of takes you away from that. But on the flip side of that, if you know that your family is good and they have all of the equipment, um, materials, and all of their um, basic needs are met, you're more likely to be able to relax at work and actually do your job because you know that your family is, is in a good um, condition. Mm -hmm. as, as instructors, as people who are in the classroom and, uh, and seminars, what has it been like teaching this kind of, these kinds of interpersonal, it sounds like a lot of interpersonal and soft skills, that you're going to have to negotiate parties that may not necessarily trust. You mentioned the word trust sure. several times. How have you guys been talking to, your, to students or, or seminar, seminar participants? Well, I, I think it's a very easy, it it's really is an easy process. I think everybody wants to learn more and, and gather more information, right? When you, when you have a lot of information readily available to you, your tendency to fear starts to minimize. Um, whether you're in a business, if you have a good plan of how you're going to recover, even if it's not the best plan in the world, at least you have an idea of what you will do, you're going to feel a little bit more um, comfortable in, in how you're handling things. So talking to the students, a lot of stuff that's taught in the books and taught in the, in the required um, teachings, you know, goes a long way to understand their personal protection, their personal needs. Um, when you don't know something and you're learning something for the first time, you're going to have a lot of questions. You're going to have a lot of um, ideas that come to you, other solutions. And that's all this basically our field is about, is, is we know what the problems are in, in our society. We know what the problems are when facing resiliency type issues. It's trying to figure out the solutions. And by putting everybody together and, and everybody in a shared voice, I think that brings 
Um, and, and it brings us to a point where you're starting to teach the young minds to move forward into a good, um, a good f non fear filled attitude that we can overcome anything that impacts us with a good thought process and a good plan. Have you gotten any surprising uh, feedback in a classroom or a seminar situation that, in, ta in having in the course of this kind of conversation we're talking about, has anyone sort of, have, have, you, have you either been surprised or maybe even come up against somebody who wasn't quite kind of getting where you were coming from, either sort of positive or negative? I, I think from a positive standpoint, um, you know, what opened our eyes as emergency management officials is the amount of people who already have their preparedness steps in place. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. From a healthcare, you know, a lot in the healthcare field, but also talking about what they could do to prevent cyber terrorism from happening and or uh, impacts to networks from a critical infrastructure or from a, a IT perspective. Um, you know, I think the lessons learned what we see. We see a lot of devastation here in the United States and, and overseas. I mean, you see what happened in Paris and, and you see what happened when it comes to active shooters. But most importantly, you saw the impacts of Hurricane Katrina and, you know, Blizzard Nemo that dropped 40 inches of snow to our mm -hmm. area. And, and people learn from that. And I think that's what's great about our community is, is number one, we, we are, when our backs are against the wall, we do come out to help out and, and to provide some sort of assistance. But number two, majority of us learn from those lessons and, and we don't want to repeat those lessons. As Tehran said earlier, a lot of individuals um, have their own personal preparedness plans and personal preparedness uh, go bags in a sense. Really? Um, to that degree? That's, and, a, that's and amazing. And it was, it was really, it was eye-opener to us in those classes that um, these, these students understood that, right? Everybody gets the alerts from Housatonic when Housatonic is closed for yeah. the day. Yeah, that yeah. happened really fast. I was really kind of surprised to know that like students really got on that really fast because, you know, they might, you know, I, I might, my uh, initial reaction when I, when they, when they implemented that was like, oh, I wonder how, I mean, I was I feared cynicism on their part, like oh, another text. The thing is buzzing all the time, like you know, like that that kind of thing. But I'm really glad to hear that. that but it, it's information. It's information sure. being shared, so that if you if you live in a distance away from Housatonic, that at least you're not you know going in an unsafe environment, driving down in conditions that may not warrant you to drive, mm -hmm. um, knowing that the schools schools closed and or this is what's happening in and around your area mm -hmm. you know there's a lot we don't we don't just say everything's perfect uh, sure. we know that there's a lot of uh, ways that we can improve and and again by reaching out to the students of Housatonic and by having them part of this this mm -hmm. process and, and the partnerships that we've established here at Housatonic it's, it's starting to pay its dividends by having folks wanting to volunteer their time and assist in their communities um, that are willing to ask those questions of their of their employers of what can we do better to prepare ourselves in any type of hazard and then finally you know we hope that they will be the voices for us moving forward that they would be the ones going out in the community and and starting to you know be the next generation that would be in these positions to to share that message and move that message forward can you can you speak to sort of you know how you know, maybe in tech, because we've been talking a little bit about healthcare, but like how, what kind of job, what kind of job title even is, you know, in networking and networks, talking about network security and stuff like that. What, what does that look like as sort of a resilient student becoming a resilient employee and being prepared for a disaster as somebody who works at a computer? Who may not, I mean, a hospital seems like, yes, in a crisis, those places are going to be filled with people you got to be able to work. But as a network employee, as a tech person, how does that, well, what, is, what kind of job are you going to have and what are you going to be doing in a crisis? Um, so for, for example, if, if your job is to maintain the servers to a big, a large scale municipality or even a healthcare facility or even a local bank, part of your responsibility is to make sure that at all times, whether people are able to access that bank or, 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 or not physically, that the servers can continuously go. And there may things, and there may be things that you can think about that what if the, um, the bank is located at 123 Main Street and that whole, uh, and within a mile radius, the power is, is lost. Um, mm -hmm. So how does that affect your financial institution if it doesn't have any power, if your backup generator doesn't work, or do you have a backup generator? And what, and how is your, um, like what type of facility do you have that's outside of your bank that actually, ha that has a, a different host or 
uh, different data backups, so to speak, that's going to have the same information as your hub does. So if that actually fails for mechanical reason or software reason, is there a separate lo location where that data is captured, mm -hmm. where you can, where that data isn't totally lost? And, and I think to echo echo what Taran just, just indicated, you know, there's there's risk specialists. You know, you're mm -hmm. analyzing risks that can impact your network and before impact, a crisis, right? before a crisis. Prior, yeah. um, mm -hmm. You know, what can impact and what cyber attacks could possibly take place that could uh, malware that could impact your your network. Um, if someone opens up a virus, what would that do to impact your your IT standpoint? Um, Everywhere you look, technology is the most important thing and, and, the, and the driving force of any agency, whether it be your cell phones, whether it be your iPads, whether it be your laptop, your desktop computers, uh, in the healthcare environment, you know, a lot of these, a lot of doctors and, and nurses and, and healthcare professionals rely upon, you know, ensuring that we're providing the right medication to the right people and I have the right patient electronically and, and everything's digital. Uh, from a critical infrastructure, we take the equipment, the, the machines that are running in a lot of these, these uh, areas, especially big business, that utilize a lot of computers nowadays to, to handle their, their productivity. Um, IT is an important, important role in everything we do, especially because we're in a technology age. Mm -hmm. um, I think we laugh sometimes where we don't usually communicate as well with people, but if we send a text and we send a social media post, everybody responds to that, right? Because <laughs> we're, we're in the Twitter nation. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, but that's great. That's just another means that we as, as emergency management officials and, you know, have to keep up to the new standards and, and ensure that we're, uh, you know, we're taking the Uber approach to provide emergency management out there, new standards, new ideas, and new solutions that would actually enable um, our businesses, our IT, but most importantly, our critical infrastructures and our, and our students to, to want to create new jobs, create the new titles and positions. Uh, we are, we're constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, from an IT standpoint, they probably, make, they probably produce the most critical components to everything we do. Yeah. yeah. Just go ahead. I was just going to say, and just to echo on um, what Scott was, was just saying about creating new jobs and how IT is becoming more and more important, and not only emergency management but also the private sector is something that people can relate to more of as of today. Is like the event that happened with Ashley uh, uh, Madison, or what is it called, Ashley um, Madison. Um, yeah, the, and the, uh, the data the, data breach, yeah, that, right. and, and then all that information, how that has a trickle effect down to the local level. Right. Um, so I, I think th those are important, and not only in the private sector but the public sector as well. As well, when you're holding what you don't consider critical information, where if that certain information, such as email addresses, et cetera, gets out to the public, it could be detrimental to a lot of. They have maybe you using agencies. the same equipment or the same yep. tech or the same security measures. Mm -hmm. You know, a, 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 a site like Ashley Madison, who's kind of yeah. you know kind of up to no good, or at least sort of yeah, creating yeah. something that's no like. But again, that could be the same thing as First National Bank on, exactly. you know, like you said, one, two, three Main Street somewhere. Exactly. Yep. But that's so. Yeah, it's, it's not even just sort of keeping up with, you know, your own, but ha uh, your own little sort of your house. Yeah. You got to know what's going on in exactly. the other houses, and something like that could touch you. Yep. Yeah, that's that's an interesting. Yeah. What Teron mentioned earlier about the backup generators mm -hmm. and all that. Hopefully, agencies already have these emergency protocols set in place. And they're telling their employ employees, but an entry level IT or healthcare worker, if they're not in the know, are there questions that they can ask their employers? Well, about? and that's a great that's that's a great great question. Um, again, everybody should know what the plan is, um, even if you are the the entry level um, employee. You should know what the plan is of if the bills, building closes, what's our backup? If we have to evacuate, where do we go? Um, if work is closed down, um, who do I need to notify? Just from those easy standpoints, but, but the most important aspect, as we said earlier, is that um, even the lowest, lowest on the totem pole um, still has to under understand that um, there are issues of workplace violence, there are issues of um, ways that your business can be impacted by a hazard um, and, you know, what you need to do individually um, at your location, what's, what's going to be requested of you at your business. Um, we can't, you know, we use the, 
the shopping mall or the, the store approach? When you hear the fire alarm going off inside a store, what's the first reaction you do is you kind of wait to see what everybody else is going to do before you react. We want to change it. We want you to be more proactive. So you should be asking those questions first to be proactive. Um, and it's not there to um, hold fault if a plan's not in place, but you may be the front runner to say, you know what, if there's no plan in place, let me be the one to create it. Let me be the one to spearhead that initiative. And and I have some ideas from what I learned at Housatonic that could help me go forward and, and help our business, you know, um, recover a lot faster. I don't know if I'm creating a false spectrum here, but you sort of fear, uh, sort of a fear response on one side and sort of diligence on the other, which is really ideal what you're looking for. Again, in working in classrooms and seminars, how have you found moving people from, you know, like you're showing them an image of what has happened, the aftermath of a crisis. You know, you tell them how many different hacks or viruses are going, like when you really kind of tell them what's going on, that how have you found people in those, you know, so students in that environment sort of react to that? And then how do you kind of try to move them from fear if they have that response to diligence in terms of being comfortable with, I know a crisis could happen and I can deal with that every day and know and be prepared? Well, I think I think the, the, the one thing that you hit upon was, you know, we as humans, we fear first and think later. We're trying to change that attitude. We're trying to provide you a lot of information where you could, and it's a lot of it's based on your training, right? It's based on your training and, and based on the information that you're gathering is to think first and then worry about the stuff later on, right? Thinking first means that if you covered all the bases pre-disaster, pre-emergency, you've walked through the scenarios, the what ifs. Is it muscle memory? Is it like it a is, muscle is, memory kind It of thing? is exactly muscle okay. memory. Um, you know, firefighters and police officers um, and even medical technicians, you know, we, you know, medical technicians learn the CPR technique and maybe never in their life ever use the CPR technique. Um, you have police officers and fire officials that train so much on ladders and ropes and, and their firearms may never have to use that firearm in their line of work. And that's Except great. For one time. And then when that one time really happens, important. they exactly know yeah. what to do based on their training because they've done all these evolutions over and over and over again where it becomes second nature. It's no different from what we're trying to establish to an emergency management approach. As a kid, we've done so many fire drills that if the fire alarm goes off, we know how to evacuate a building. We know how to get out of a bus if the fire alarm goes off or if we have to evacuate a bus. Why not practice those safe measures from a virus standpoint, a network infiltration, a business recovery Your server goes down, how quickly can you get the backup server up? 100%, right? and just practice that, and practice and practice and practice. And, and once we establish that, and once we go over the what ifs, Anything that's thrown out, out at us during that hazard, you could minimize the impacts. Are you ever going to eliminate the chaos? Probably not, but you'd be able hmm. to you'll be able to minimize the chaos, and that's really what we're trying to trying to establish here. Yeah. And the information that we normally provide is not meant. The intention is not to ever really scare anybody, but just to give you information. Because the more information people have, the more comfortable they are in, in, in any event, whether that's on in academia or that's in your your professional feel like what Morgan said earlier about a new employee inquiring about a generator and a b backup plan. If that employee is never told and never given that knowledge that these things are available to you or this is who to contact if you smell gas or anything um, versus someone telling them that, listen, if you smell gas, this is who, um, who you call, this is what you do and there is a backup generator and these things are available to you. That person is not they are aware of the dangers of that facility, but they are just more knowledgeable about what to actually do. And it goes back to what Scott mentioned about training and just training and, and knowledge. And once you gain the knowledge of a certain event or things that can happen, then you get trained on how to actually deal with those and find solutions to those. And you're kind of less fearful. Um, the word knowledge has come up quite a bit, and I, I want to kind of wrap up with... Um, Kind of asking, kind of why us? You know, really, sort of particular. Like, what is it about Housatonic? Like, you know, there there are schools all over. This is, you know, we're in the main drag in '95. There's plenty of schools up and down. You know, within 20 minutes of here. Um, why was it important to sort of either a community college or us here at Housatonic, in terms of like making, you know, really working with students? Like, why why a community college and why Housatonic in terms of you know talking about bringing that knowledge to people? Well, I think the most important thing is is Housatonic has shown 
that they want to be creative in and in, in formulating the partnerships and they want to be a front runner in ensuring that their students have the best and, and the brightest and, and the most accurate information moving moving and, and that could help them move forward in their uh, not only their student life but in their careers. Mm -hmm. um, Housatonic, you know, from a Bridgeport perspective, is probably one of the most important um, agencies or critical infrastructures that we have within our community. Um, you are in the heart of the downtown Bridgeport area. Um, any hazard can impact um, Housatonic at any given time. And your management staff, your management, your emergency management team, um, your president um, is, is showing that proactiveness to ensure that um, not only faculty, but also the, the students have the most up-to-date information and the most up-to-date coursework and training that can, you know, that can evolve into something as a career. Um, and, and I think that in itself um, should be, you know, you should give, give applause to Husadonic for wanting to be that, um, that agency that steps forward and says, we, we will do this. It's something new, but we want to do that. And, and the success rate right now, from what we're hearing from statistics, um, they are beyond anything that we've read so far, um, have been nothing more than, than that than the best at what they're doing right now in this in this project and and providing numbers that are, are more or less uh, beyond any other community college or any other universities that have been part of this this process mm -hmm. um, and and that's applaudable that helps us out in the long run and that allows us to reach a an area that we may not technically um, have had the opportunity to reach out to. Um, students and, and faculty may think it's never going to happen here, but uh, uh, Housatonic is now mm -hmm. formulating themselves into a, a top partner. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you guys Thank for you. coming in. Thank you. This for having us. Great.